Okay. Hello, and thank you for uh, joining this talk. So my name is uh, Francois, and I work for uh, Aris, an international IT company. So this talk will uh, actually be divided in two parts. The first one will be a slide deck, where I will introduce and define the reactive application concept. And then uh, I will showcase a reactive web application that I have built on top of Spring Webflux and Couchbase. Okay, reactive web application. I think you all know what uh, web applications are. So let's focus on the reactive keyword. So reactive systems are actually real-time oriented systems because their user may change direction, their user may change their mind depending on the data change. So there is a need for a real-time interface and a reactive interface. There are typical use cases for which a uh, reactive interface uh, may be required, uh, such as trading applications, betting systems, because obviously you need to update the odds uh, based on an event in real time, game dashboard, with, which is actually the, um, uh, the use case I will demonstrate afterwards, and chatting systems. So as I told you, on the backend side, uh, I will leverage uh, Spring Webflux to bring this reactivity. And on the front-end side, let's see now uh, what we can have. So, according to uh, W3C, there are three main different patterns for building reactive interfaces. And we will see those three patterns now. And we will start actually with uh, the dirtiest, what I call the ugly. And it's polling. Actually, polling is not a reactive API, but it is very often used to give the illusion of a reactive interface. So it's a pattern that uh, either rely on the very famous uh, XML HTTP request object or uh, the pretty modern fetch API. So typically, when polling, you use the set interval method on the window object with a delay, and then you ask the backend if there was uh, any data change. Support-wise, the XHR API is uh, pretty old, so it's very widely supported in uh, modern browsers. However, as you can imagine, polling is definitely not the most optimized way of building a reactive interface. So in this slide, uh, you can see the number of round trips between your client application and the backend, comparing polling with real reactive interfaces at the bottom of the slide. So both polling and long polling, which is a kind of uh, polling version 2, they trigger much more round trips than reactive APIs. When using polling, there is no server-to-client communication, so your client application is not aware of any data change, and thus you need to regularly ask the backend if something changed. So you need to send useless HTTP requests. So if you consider switching to reactive API, you will decrease the load on the server, you will save uh, some battery uh, on the running device, and your application will actually react faster. So it's needless to say that reactive API are actually better alternative than polling. So let's see now which kind of reactive API we can use. Most of the time, when speaking about web reactive API, people think about the WebSocket. It's a bidirectional reactive API that allows communication from the server to the client and the other way around. WebSocket do not uh, run on HTTP, so they have their own protocol. And support-wise, uh, okay, it's also widely supported by modern browsers because it exists since many years now. Another alternative, and a better one, is the even source API. It's a kind of half WebSocket, so you cannot send messages, but you can receive messages via the same message callback that you would have on the, on the WebSocket. So it's only a one-way communication channel, but it runs on HTTP. When looking at browser support, you should know that Microsoft-based browsers do not support the event source, but hopefully you can uh, work around this with pretty nice polyfills. So 
why should you consider even source better than WebSocket? Because actually on the front-end side, it looks pretty similar. That's true, but on the server side, there are many differences. First, let's remind that WebSockets are bidirectional, while SSE is only one-way communication. But hopefully, most of the time when you build an application, you don't need a two-way low latency communication channel. Receiving messages is often enough, unless you're building a, a video game or a chatting system. A huge difference between both is the protocol. Uh, so as I mentioned, WebSocket rely on their own protocol, while SSE runs over HTTP. So the WebSocket is actually completely unfriendly with the HTTP ecosystem, while SSE are fully compatible uh, with firewalls, load balancers, HTTP proxies, and so on. According to me, the main uh, drawback to, of, of WebSocket is the scalability, because in order to sustain the same amount of user, you will need much more hardware resource um, considering WebSocket than SSE. So actually, uh, the rule is pretty simple. If you don't need a two-way communication channel, then you should use SSE. OK, that's already done uh, for the slide part. Uh, let's now see the demo. So you can actually check uh, the source code uh, on my GitHub. OK, so as I told you, I've built a live game dashboard. So it's based on uh, the football games that occurred uh, last week uh, in the very famous Belgian uh, soccer league. And it's uh, leveraging two event sources that I will show you in the network tab. I will filter. So OK, as you can see, we have two event sources. The first one. Uh, subscri subscription count helps me to display this uh, counter over there. And the second one will be used whenever there will be a, a, uh, an update on the score, it will flow into this. Okay? So I will show you the, a change on the subscription count by creating um, a Firefox uh, client. As you can see, now we have actually three. So I think uh, some of you already uh, catched that you can use this um, URL to connect with your smartphone uh, onto my, uh, my laptop. So please mind the HTTPS URI scheme. And then you will also have to accept uh, my custom certificate as a security exception. And you will be able to, to join uh, my, my look at app. OK, we are already six and counting. <laughs> OK, I will pin this tab so that you can keep on connecting. And I will simulate the score update using the Couchbase dashboard. So Couchbase is a NoSQL data store that comes with additional features that I will demonstrate later on. But then let's first update the score. So I will simulate a game update in my database, and the flow should be the game should be flowing into my game event source there. And there it is. So we have, uh, in the Chrome browser, we have an event stream tab that monitors the content that is sent uh, from the server to the client. And you, you can see here uh, the JSON of the game that has been updated, which helped me to build and to update my UI. OK, because I'm a pretty lazy guy, I don't want to update manually each time the game in my dashboard. So I have built a small endpoint that I will now schedule using a fixed rate of 10 seconds. And this endpoint will actually um, find all the game in my repository, randomize the score, and save back the game in my bucket. So I will restart. You will be disconnected, but you will be automatically reconnected uh, again. OK. So now we can see we have a lot of coming notifications, and it actually looks like a bit of spam. Uh, so I've built a feature that allows me to customize the subscription, not to get notified for all the game, but only to get notified for my favorite game. So uh, on Chrome, I will favorite uh, Anderlecht team, 
and on Firefox, I will favorite gang team. So I should now uh, only receive update for those favorite games, and that's the case. So if we look what happened now um, on the network tab, we can see that we have canceled the previous subscription that was listening to old games. And we have a new one, which with a request parameter uh, corresponding to the favorite team, and we are only receiving back uh, the corresponding games. So you can do the same with uh, your smartphone or with, you, with your laptop, right? Okay, that's it for the demo, and now I will show you some interesting part in the code that I'm using to build this system. First, I will show you a pretty nice feature of Couchbase, which is called Eventing Service. Uh, it allows you to write functions that act like JavaScript triggers. Here I have built uh, one React function, uh, what I called React, uh, and it's invoked every update. Every time there is an update on the bucket, this function is invoked, and as a uh, parameter, I receive the updated document. In this very specific case, I'm using this updated record uh, as a payload to post it back onto my Spring Boot container uh, with the event slash id pass. And I'm also adding a request parameter equivalent to the name of the Java class. So let's see now how Spring will handle this. So I have created a bean. I'm leveraging a Webflux DSL to create a request mapping, a dynamic request mapping, listening to this pass, slash event slash, slash ID, only for the post HTTP method. And I'm filtering on the Couchbase user region just to be able to get, to, to get notified via Couchbase and not via any other uh, hackers or whatever. I'm also filtering uh, on the uh, Java class name and consuming JSON content type. And I'm transforming every payload into a game model object. And this game is then published onto a publish and subscribe message channel, which allows me to have a broadcasting. So one publisher, many subscribers. By default, it's not the case. By default, it, it's, um, I think, a direct uh, channel. And you cannot do that. Finally, I'm turning this integration flow into a reactive publisher. Okay? So let's see now uh, how we can use this reactive publisher and to expose it uh, to, uh, to an API. So I have built um, a REST controller that is actually uh, auto wiring this, uh, this reactive publisher. And this publisher can be very easily converted into a stream via the flux.stream method. And then this flux can be returned as is uh, in a get mapping method. Okay? Just mine the produce header, which is a text event stream. And then this flux can be consumed via the event source API without any other post processing. So it's fully compatible. And it's pretty interesting. Eventually, I can filter the values that are uh, produced by my stream uh, to the, uh, using the optional uh, list of favorite teams. But OK, that's it. We can use the flux as is to be consumed by the event source API. That's the message. The other flux is a bit uh, more tricky to build. So functionally, what, what do we want here? We want to have a counter that is incremented every time there is a subscription, which is decremented every time there is a cancel. And we want to publish those values into another stream. So here we can leverage the uh, create method on a flux processor so that we create an empty flux. And because it's a flux processor, we can call the dot sync method, which allows us to retrieve a flux sync. And using this sync object, you can control whatever is published over the stream. So every time I will call the dot .next method on this sync, the corresponding object will be published into the originating stream, which is the subscription count. Okay? Actually, uh, that's the end of the talk. That's all I wanted to show you today. 
Um, thank you for your attention. Thank you for testing my application. I think you were more than uh, 50. And if you have any question, please come downstairs. Thank you.